involved here. Here's Javier. He says, Shohei Otani to the Dodgers is going to be the biggest signing in baseball history. Mega, mega contract. There's no doubt about it. You know, I, I, how do you negotiate a contract to an icon like this? Um, do you give him $40 million a year to start as your designated hitter? And then do you give him an opt-out clause after two years or maybe a clause in which you renegotiate based on if he becomes the star pitcher again? I think that's the big question is structure of the contract. Everybody that I've canvassed of the opinion that Otani winds up at Dodger Stadium, that the Angels never made the offer or got it rejected. I don't know that San Francisco's got this historical track record to lure him there. Seattle does because they have a good farm system. They did have the great run with Ichiro Suzuki. And then there's the guys on the East Coast where money is no object. That's the Yankees and Mets. But does he want to go there? Because he's lived as a superstar in a quiet situation in Anaheim. He would be in a fishbowl squared with the Yankees, the Red Sox, or even uh, the New York Mets. What do you think? Well, you know, the number of Japanese players have had success with the Yankees. I'm thinking of uh, Ichiro. And then um, what was the other guy? It was Godzilla. Right? Remember, he was like a big DH. He hit a lot of home runs. Mm -hmm. But, I, I, you know, Preller is cooking up something. You know, they, they, if he trades Bogarts and Soto, he might be clear in space to get Otani. What do you think? I think you're reaching. You will separate your shoulder reaching that far on that one. Especially, I mean, if, if indeed the payroll has to come way down. 50 mil is big. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a reach to think that that Ichiro, I'm not Ichiro, that uh, Showtime is coming here. I think Dodger Stadium is a great destination yeah, point. For that's the odds on favorite. No great, doubt. great Japanese star. Next question. Okay, let's move on here to John. And he says, hey, has Mike Schilt had any interviews besides the Padres? Preller better lock him up before someone else gives him a job. No, and I don't know if it's got to be reputation precedes him that the relationship in St. Louis was so bad at the end, and now he's openly admitted that he's not a young guy. Uh, you know, baseball's hiring a lot of young managers, so may, it may well be just past track record because it ended so ugly in St. Louis, and he fought with the the analytical people all the time, uh, and the fact that he's he's not 41 years old. Uh, it looks to me that he's probably the guy. I hope he's the guy because he's got a resume, and I'd rather hire a resume rather than another A.J. Preller rookie or friend. You, you know, I saw a video clip of Schilt, and normally you only see photographs of him, and he just looks like a very mild-mannered dude. But he was doing one of those post-game clubhouse things when he was the manager of the Cardinals. And that dude was dropping F-bombs, and we're going to come and kick their ass, and yada, yada. <laughs> I'm like, well, maybe this guy might be the ticket. Well, if they give him the freedom to run the clubhouse the way a major league clubhouse should be run, where the manager controls the clubhouse and controls the dugout. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's go to Ryan here. And Ryan says, I'm skeptical of James Harden on the Clippers, especially when he says, I'm not a system player. I am a system. <laughs> would you much rather see the Clippers trade with the 76ers to get Tobias Harris back? I would have missed I would have missed him on the Clippers and could help the team more than Harden. Well, Harden. I think, first of all, he's making his debut against the New York Knicks. Clippers starting this East Coast road trip. Mm. Uh, they're going to cap his minutes early on because he's missed an awful lot of camp. Um, I think that the big question to me is when he's on the floor, he needs the ball. And when he has the ball, then what happens to Kawhi Leonard and Paul George? Chris Harden has to control the ball so he can take his shots. Uh, is he going to stay out of hot water because he's been such a troublemaker at the last three spots in his NBA career that he talked himself off the roster, got his ass traded. <laughs> now, I also said something. Nobody else has signed on to what I've said, and that's that's okay. You can be wrong. I think they got him as an insurance policy for point production. If something were to happen with the injury-prone Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, you got Harden's historical 24-point-per-game average. I think that's a wild card in this acquisition. But I think he knows his reputation has really taken a hit because of the way he's acted. He knows he's on the final year of his contract. He becomes a street free agent next year. So he needs to have a good season and he needs to be part of everything they're doing. But I do think the intangible, I think he was an insurance policy to guard against something bad happening to Kawhi or PG. 
Well, can you imagine if they did a hard knocks episode like or series on the Clippers? This would be the year for it. I mean, it's like a reality TV show. Well, it's been a reality show wherever James Harden or his buddy Kyrie Irving have gone <laughs> of late. We move on in fans form. Okay, moving on. And let's go here to John. And he says, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, is it time for Preller to be fired? Well, this conversation's gone on and on, but ownership or Peter Seidler at this point still sees him. And the word he used was excellence. I don't see it right now, but because of this contract that runs through 2027, they're not going to fire him at this point. Now, if next year turns out to be a boondoggle and another bad season, substandard underachieving season, maybe something changes. But maybe something changes in ownership, too. Mm. Maybe Peter Seidler won't be the day-to-day owner of this franchise going forward. I hate to say that, but that's the reality, I think, when you're talking about uh, a man who has done great things, but a man's had great health problems and is now struggling again. We'll see what magic Preller works, but obviously I, I don't agree. There's a ton of people don't agree with the amount of money he spent, the contract length of extensions that he gave, the fact he's traded the farm system away twice. And outside of the three-month run a year ago and they beat the Dodgers, they haven't done bleep in nine years. Hate to be unfair to AJ because I like AJ. But the scoreboard does not lie. Yeah. Well, some of those years he was, you know, tanking to get the draft picks. But I saw a graph on Twitter today that showed it ranked all the teams since 2009, looking at every trade and the F war, you know, to see the productivity of these players who made the best deals and the, and the worst deals. And the Padres are number two, the second best trading since 2009. So that's kind of how I see Preller. He's made some bad deals but he's had way more good deals than bad deals. My golden retriever could sign all those players if he overpaid for every one of them. (laughs) So that's, it's just a big, big issue in terms of his mode of business. I think he's got one more year. We'll see if this thing flips and if the underachievers come back and have the kind of statistical seasons that they should have. But as we said, if I'm counting, we got five, holes on the pitching staff, or maybe it's seven, or maybe it's 10. Yeah, that could be a hell of a lot of them. Here, here's a Dodger comment here from Muller. He says, I think Kershaw will sign with the Dodgers at a very low cost so he can rehab with them. And if he is ready to pitch, we'll come back for a few starts. We yeah, hope so. I mean, he he represents so many great things in a modern day ball player, not just being a Hall of Fame pitcher, but what he and his wife have done in the community in terms of their foundations, both in Los Angeles and in Dallas, Fort Worth, I got so upset during that playoff game when he got booed. You're booing Clayton Kershaw. What the hell is wrong with you for what he's represented uh, to this franchise? You know, it, it may well be the Dodgers sign him to a contract that's based on does does he get back on the mound in July? Is it? It's probably a twenty million dollar contract, or maybe it's ten million with incentives that could get to twenty if Clayton Kershaw becomes vintage Clayton Kershaw again, or Maybe they just have a, an agreement that he rehabs and he sits, and then they'll sign him to a back end loaded deal once he's ready to pitch starting in July. It'd be fascinating to see how they handle this. Yeah. Well, it, it's not just Kershaw, but all the pitchers on that staff all have intriguing storylines. So, yeah, I think we're going to have Padres and Dodgers fighting for free agent pitchers. You can count on that. Move on here. Moving on. Let's go to Angel. And Angel says, hey, this is about the uh, the Rams. Three straight losses, including yesterday at Green Bay, where the Packers trying to give the game away. Is it safe to assume the Rams' playoff hope has been shot? Over uh, it, injuries. You know, they lost their right tackle, Rob Haverstein. Obviously, Matthew Stafford is out right now with the injury. Just not really competitive offensively. I don't think that Jordan Love is, is going to be a big-time star in Green Bay yet. Uh, but... It, it's just a byproduct of this franchise in rebuild mode, has to be in rebuild mode. You look at the look on the face of Aaron Donald sitting on the bench in the fourth quarter of that game when they're getting blown out. What was it, 20-3 to three at one point? It's been a long season for a veteran player that's making an enormous amount of money, but they are in just rebuild mode there. Yeah, and I mean, and, and they didn't have their quarterback, you know, for that game. So, yeah, the Rams are done. I think they kind of surprised us in the early part of the season. Stockpiled a lot of draft picks. You know, mm-hmm. they had... I think they had 12 draft picks this past season, so those guys are all in there, and they're going to get, obviously, I think a fairly high draft pick, with the exception of the the, the decrepit 
Arizona Cardinals and the obviously collapsing New York Giants. Rams would probably maybe get the third or fourth pick in the draft. Wow. No, let's, let's see what happens. Let's move on. we got so much to cover here. Let's go to Steve talking about Ducks. He says, hey, the Ducks look great. Wow. Maybe Verbeek knows more than I thought. Well, they lost for so many years. They stockpiled so many high picks. And these kids, I mean, they force-fed all these kids on the ice. They, I think they have four players that are 20 or younger on this roster right now. Nobody in the NHL has that many draft picks. Now, will it catch up to them? Maybe it will. Uh, there's no doubt that Leo Carlson's a really good player. He's got three goals in his first two weeks as an 18-year-old. And there's no doubt that this young defenseman, Min Yukov, uh, is is a tremendous offensive talent. they got to work on his what he does at the other end of the ice. So far, so good. But it is a long season. I do recall a couple times in the last couple of years, Dallas Akins, who I really liked as a coach, he had him in first place. And how did it work out by the time they got to the finish line of a 80-game schedule? Last place, and he got fired. Mm. So what you do early is great. Got to be able to continue to do it. Got to keep him on the ice. But uh, they got an awful lot of kids. Conversely, it's been, been tough down here because we expected a bunch of those kids <coughs> to be with the goals. And it's been very, very tough. Gulls won their first two games on the road in Ontario. I was really surprised and pleased. They have not won since. They have six losses in a row. Hmm. And they're finding it really hard to score goals. And it's not like the Ducks have taken any other forwards up. They've, this is their roster. So it's it's a growing period, I think, for the, the goals going forward. But it's been fascinating to see what the Ducks are doing. So give the Ducks a watch. Okay, well, let's get, we got an Aztec comment here. And this is from Robert. He says, since Aztec's men's basketball season is here, do you think the fans and the students will completely shut out Aztec football? Has not happened already? <laughs> yeah. They do homecoming, 14,343. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. It's sad. You know, and this is coming from somebody who broadcast Aztec football in the Marshall Falk era. That was the era. They were drawing 48 to 51,000 on Saturday nights notably for the shootout games with Brigham Young. It was a big, big issue. And the, the, the amount of revenue they've lost because they can't sell these tickets, and now they've discounted the tickets for a second year in a row, the whole business plan has just blown up in their face. I, I hold the athletic department responsible. You're the one that priced this thing. Now, Brady Hoke is held responsible for what's happened on the football field. And then as the intangible of the NIL, they just can't compete. With apologies, San Diego State has become Wyoming and Colorado State, struggling on the field, and they don't have the money to make it work. They need somebody to pick up the Aztec flag, somebody from corporate San Diego, whether he's an Aztec alum or wants to do something for the university on behalf of football, to become a fundraiser to create money for the NIL so they can go compete uh, with players. They couldn't get any money in the transfer portal. You know, basketball suffered the same thing. Basketball's got a decent NIL package, but it's been hard on the Aztec basketball to go get immediate stars coming in the front door because they can't compete with what North Carolina and all these other yeah. big basketball schools are doing. San Diego State football is face down on the pavement because they just don't have the resources. Somebody in San Diego corporate, maybe it's Joseph Sy, there's got to be a godfather that will step forward and say, I believe in the program. Because historically, in recent decades, good coaches, a lot of really good kids, it's a fine academic institution. Yeah. They've done a great job upgrading facilities. They need a, a godfather to come in to help them on the business side to see if they can make something happen, which would flip this program back into exciting the community. Because right now, no excitement at all. Well, they, they've fallen so fast, you know. It, just a few years ago, they were in the bowls every year. But, you know, the, the women's soccer team, the Wave, they sold out Snapdragon. So it can be done if they have a good product on the field. Concur with you wholeheartedly. Let's get oh, some good. social media. Oh, yeah, you think? Yeah, you think? You think all Raider right. Nation standing in line? <laughs> yeah, let's get some Raider Nation comments. There's some good ones in here. And this is from uh, G. Sensi, and, and he says, why are you addressing Raider Nation when we intimately know this team, their history, and all their issues? 
what are you doing here is not reporting. It's regurgitating all that has been said ad nauseum. Raider Nation is not a fan base. It's family. And thick or thin, we don't waver. Something you certainly have no experience with in San Diego. And who the F are you to say that anyone is drunk all the time, let alone one of the largest and most loyal fan bases in sports? By the look of you, you haven't missed a day of drinking in years. That's the best you can bring. <laughs> Scoreboard does not lie. Hey, talk show host, I am not the one that is 119 and 211. I've had more than two winning seasons in 23 years doing what I do with the content that I do. I'm just curious, Raider Nation, aside from putting your face paint on and your costume and getting drunk, how come you don't hold Mark Davis and even back farther, the Al Davis regime, accountable for what they've given you over the last 23 years. What am I missing in that conversation? Yeah, I, well, it just seems like Al Davis is sort of like a god. You know, he's a, well, he, he was back in yeah. the day, but that was back in the day. Yeah, but he still carried that reputation. And Mark Davis is like, you know, the son. And I think they just kind of give him some of that slack. But yeah, I mean, if I'm paying money to go see the Raiders, I want to see him win. And like they they won last week. So let's see if they keep it going. Got one more Raider Nation comment. Go here ahead. Because they were just piling on in Instagram. This is from uh I'm I'm cool with it. Uh LOL. Um, I'm a big uh I'm big fan of your content, but this is the worst take I've ever heard from you, sir. With all respect, not all the Raider fans are the same. You could say whatever you want about Mark Davis, but at least he had uh, cojones to let uh, go of sorry um uh, Josh McDaniels while your team, the Chargers, can't let go of their head coach Staley because, of course, he don't got money uh, like that. Shaking my head, I'm really disappointed in you, sir. You can be disappointed, but <laughs> thanks for watching and participating. So Mark Davis has got cojones to keep making stupid moves. You understand how many mistakes he's made since 2011, 2013? I mean, it is absolutely stunning. And you're signing the memo that all is okay. <laughs> hey, if you got that kind of money to burn to go support a team that's almost 100 games under 500 with Mark and Al, that's okay. But you got money to burn, send it to me. Because <laughs> John and I, we'll be glad to go drink beer on your tab. Funny story. We'll wrap it up with this. As a talk show host on 690 and 1090 and then being the longtime popular voice of the Chargers, I got into it with Raider fans all the time. I mean, you know, my favorite phrase was Raider Nation out of jail on bail, call now, or Raider Nation uh, in a stolen car with a stolen car phone. Your line is open. Here's the best one. So we're up in L.A. This was the year the Chargers made the run to go to the Super Bowl. And that was in the old L.A. Coliseum, big press box, but it was right above the seats. So we're doing a game at halftime. Chargers are blowing the Raiders out. I think Jeff Hostetler had thrown three interceptions in the first half. We were up like 21 nothing. The fans were, they were drunk and they were booing. <laughs> so we're getting towards halftime. We get to the two-minute break. And so we go to commercial on the network. And I'm looking down and there's this Raider fan stumbling up the stairwell towards us. And I, I assumed he was coming right towards us. And I'm sure he's going to say something to me because I'm the talk show host that says something to them every day at four o'clock for the best 15 minutes in radio. <laughs> so I turned to my broadcast partner, Jim Laslovic, and I said, what is that smell? And Jim turns to Pat Curran. Pat Curran says, that's weed. And I said, well, it's not hamburgers are cooking. So <laughs> anyways, Raider fan gets to the top step <laughs> seats, looks right into the radio booth, opens his jacket, pulls out a bunch of marijuana joints. Right on. Offered it to <laughs> us. You guys, come here. You light up here. Half time. You got time. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Other thing, we go to the stadium really early to uh, set up for the broadcast because we did the nine-hour game day show. So it's like 10 a.m., and we park in the media parking lot, and we have a long walk to to get to the Coliseum. There's Raider fans partying by the by the entry tunnel. Mm -hmm. Raider fans come running up. He knew who I was. Hacksaw, listen to your show. So he had uh, a fifth of Jack Daniels. He had shot glasses. <laughs> he 
He said, hey, Laz and Pat, like you guys too. You want to have a couple shots? Is it 10 a.m. in the morning? Nah, I think I'll pass. But thank you. Thanks for listening. And the third funny story was, my favorite phrase was, show me your lightning bolt. So we're, we're coming out of the game one time. This was, I think, in Oakland of the Coliseum. Towards the parking lot, lugging all this heavy radio equipment. Some guy across the way screams at me and says, Axaw, show me your lightning bolt. And I felt like saying, hey, Raider Nation, show me your rap sheet. But I <laughs> elected not to do that because I didn't want to get shot in the parking lot of the Oakland Coliseum. So. Well, you know, those Raider fans, they know how to party, man. I mean, they're they're bringing the ganja, they're bringing the, the whiskey, they're, and they're friendly to the Charger broadcast team. So I, I like that. That's a good story. It was good exchange of verbal gunfire. <laughs> hey, listen, we hope you have enjoyed our bonus Monday podcast episode.